I want to just dive right into the numbers that we've gotten most recently, right? So 500,000 deaths in the U.S., uh, but at the same time, we have about some 200 million people who've been vaccinated already. I'm just wondering, do you think, you know, from your perspective, is this under control at this point, or have we reached any sort of turning point in this pandemic um, with regard to the trajectory of this virus? You know, I, I, th I think this is a point where we can be cautiously optimistic. Uh, uh, that's, not, that's not to say we can let up on what we're doing. Um, but if we, if we keep going with the public health measures, wearing our masks, washing our hands, keeping apart, uh, if we get vaccinated when it's our turn, um, I truly think that we could be seeing the end of this pandemic um, later this year. And, and I can't fully explain why. The numbers of cases that have been dropping across the country, the, the decline in hospitalizations and deaths is, um, is remarkable. Um, and it's probably due to a number of different factors. It, it definitely is not all due to, to vaccination. Vaccination, I think, is responsible for the declines we're seeing in uh, cases in, in, in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. Uh, but the decline across the country and around the globe, uh, it may be due to the seasonality of the, of the virus, or it, it, it's also in part due to the things that we're all doing to try and keep this under control. And that gives me a lot of hope. So here in the US, uh, I'm reading that, you know, children make up about a quarter of the population, yet there are no vaccinations available for children. I've had a lot of parents ask me, when is this possible? Uh, you know, given the timeline of the trials that are ongoing, um, what is your best guess or estimate for when children could begin to receive vaccine? Yeah, you know, I, I'm a pediatrician and, and a parent, and I, I can't wait until we have vaccines for, for children. Um, in, in listening to Dr. Fauci and, and others, um, it sounds like there will be vaccines for high school students uh, by this fall, and that's a good thing because You'll, you're, you're more likely to see severe disease and, and transmission from, from high school kids, from older children than you are from very young ones. For younger children, it will probably not be until the beginning of next year, uh, 2022, before there's vaccines available. And so uh, while we will get closer to what we think of as normal uh, by this summer, by the fall, by next holiday season, uh, we won't be fully there until we have vaccines that are available for everybody. Uh, and Dr. Bester, when you say that vaccines available for everybody, we, we take such a U.S., you know, American-centric view of this. But in order to, you know, begin to move around the world in a way that we once were, wouldn't that also require vaccine to become available to everyone else and all those other places? I'm just... So, uh, you know, hopeful and also curious about when that might happen, given that we have most of the vaccine along with, you know, Western Europe, the developed world, let's say, um, that's available. Yeah, that's such an important point. One of, one of the big concerns I have is uh, the, the cornering of the vaccine market by, by wealthier nations. Um, it's, it's a short-sighted approach. Uh, it's it's short-sighted because of the ethical and moral uh, responsibility we have as the world's wealthiest nation to help support uh, nations with, with fewer resources. Uh, but it's also short-sighted in that any transmission of this, this virus, widespread transmission in any country, puts the entire globe at risk. What we've been seeing so far is the emergence of of new strains, of variants of this, of this virus uh, in many different places. And those strains, um, if you don't get protection from the current vaccines or from the infection with the strain that's been here before, if those strains are, are that different, then it puts us at risk for going through the same cycle again that we've gone through over the, over the past year. So it's in our self-interest to help provide support uh, for vaccination of people everywhere. Uh, you spent time as the acting director of the CDC. I'm wondering, looking at how things have transpired over the last year now, um, you know, is there some 
thing that you thought, oh, I would change this, or it was there a point in time that was, you know, significant for you in, in, in going, why are we doing it this way? Or why aren't people understanding uh, X, Y, or Z? Is there a, a point in time that stands out for you? You know, when, when I look back to the last year and, and some of the challenges, uh, I think they started way back in, in February, where public health leaders were sounding the alarm that this could be bad. Uh, and political leaders out of the White House were saying there's nothing to worry about. The numbers are going to go to zero. It's going to go away. Um, I led emergency preparedness and response at CDC for four years. And and one of the things that we recognized as a critical success factor in any response was to keep politics out of it. Uh, because as soon as you have a public health emergency that's politicized, then people's willingness to do the things to protect themselves and their community, uh, their willingness to provide resources uh, will be reflected by their politics rather than the best public health science. And we saw a politicization of this pandemic and its response from its earliest days. And we were never able to catch up to that. It, it led to uh, the decision to wear a mask being based more on one's political affiliation than on one's understanding of how viruses are transmitted and what we could do as a nation to protect each other. Do you think this experience will change anything scientifically moving forward? I mean, gosh, the development of these vaccines, mRNA technology, uh, you know, we're living through these, these very rapid changes already, but do you think it will change anything else? You know, one of the things that gives me in incredible hope is that one year into the recognition of a new virus, a new infectious agent, we have several vaccines that have been shown to be safe and effective. That's absolutely miraculous. That's nothing, we've never had anything like that in public health history. And it gives me hope that as new infectious agents emerge, and they will, this is not a one-time one event, pandemics will occur, but we will be able to respond faster than, than ever. This is the proof of that. And it's not that the technology here uh, was just started last year. It's the consequence of decades of investment in basic science and scientific research. So I'm, I'm hoping that it will give Congress uh, the resolve to say we need to continue to support this kind of work so that we're always ready. And I hope it leads Congress to say that we need to give everyone in America what they need to be, to be safe whenever there's a crisis. When you look across the globe at countries that have responded to this better than we have, and it's not hard to find countries that have responded better than we have, most of them have a, a social safety net um, that truly provides for the needs of their population. Uh, when you look at, at America, uh, at the start of this pandemic, more than 25 million people lacked health insurance. Um, half of low-income workers lacked unemployment insurance or sick leave or family medical leave. Without those pieces in place, people's decisions regarding their health uh, had, to be, had to be colored by their, their economics. Uh, you know, if you have to go to work to put food on the table and pay the rent, you're not gonna be able to follow public health guidance to stay home if you think you've been exposed. So we need as a society to come, come together and make these long-term policy changes so that everyone in our country has the protections they need to be safe when the next pandemic arrives. Uh, and you know, gosh, next pandemic, whew, that made me you just need to pause for a second. Um, <laughs> so, when you talk about masks, uh, I think, and, and vaccine, a lot of people say, well, I've, I've been vaccinated. Why do I still need to wear a mask? Uh, this is a big and a very ongoing conversation happening, at least in our community in North Texas. Can you uh, sort of explain the reasoning behind that? Yeah. You know, there will come a day when public health officials say, put your mask away. We don't need, we don't need it anymore. And, and so hang on for that day. But right now, there's still a number of things that are unknown. We, you know, we keep hearing reports about new variants and new strains that are, that are being identified here and around the globe. Um, we don't know yet whether people who have been 
vaccinated against the strain that's been, been circulating in the United States have full protection against those new variants. A mask will help with that. We don't know yet whether people who've been vaccinated against the current strains that are circulating in the United States could still have the potential of spreading the virus to someone who hasn't been vaccinated. That's an unknown question. When those things, questions have been answered, and when we have vaccines for children and for, for everyone who, who could be susceptible, then I think we're gonna hear the message, you can put the, the mask away. But you know, it may be that, that masks are something that are with us forever going, going into the future during certain times of the year. One of the, one of the things that we've recognized this winter, and it's absolutely astounding, is that flu, uh, influenza, which comes every winter, has been almost non-existent. And that I think is because of the mask wearing that we're doing and the social distancing. And what you see in, in, in quite a number of countries is that during flu season, people wear masks when they're traveling, when they're on public transit, when they're out and about, not, not in and around their house and in restaurants and things, but for certain activities. And it could be into the future that yeah, winter's here, I got my masks. Oh yeah, I got a new one. Yeah, it's got a great pattern. Oh, we, where'd you get that mask? I, I'd like to get that one too. That could be something that's, that's in our future that could help keep us all a little bit safer during flu season. Hmm. Uh, and finally, I'm wondering, you know, if, if there's a silver lining in all of this for you, again, with your expertise and from your perspective, um, is there any good that's come out of this, despite so many deaths and so much suffering, so many changes that we've all had to endure in, in terms of just how we live and work and act? Um, is there a, an upside? Well, you know, I, I, I hope so. Uh, I, I, I worked in the, in the area of public health emergencies and emergency response for a long time at, at, at CDC. And one of the things that always disturbed me was that there was always a lot of interest in providing resources during a crisis and maybe right after a crisis. And then after that, uh, there was a sense of, I don't want to think about it anymore. I'm, I'm over that. Let's, let's move, move on. And so the lessons that could have been learned weren't learned. And you know, coming out of this, if we decide as a nation that we want to invest in our public health system, so that it's, it's robust and strong, that would be a terrific thing. We've never done that before. We've let our public health system fall apart in between crises. But if we, if we come together and say, yeah, at the federal, state, local, tribal levels, we wanna have a, a, a modern public health system so that in the midst of a crisis, we don't have 50 different vaccine systems, registration systems in every country. That, that we, that, that we wanna say, we wanna have a data collection system that, that lets us truly identify who is being hit the hardest. Uh, and we wanna repair our safety net so that every day in America isn't a crisis for millions and millions of people. And when a pandemic hits, it's not devastating to certain communities. If we learn those lessons, then I'd say, yeah, you know, we have come out of this pandemic stronger than before. But if we ignore that so that when the next pandemic comes, we come at, into it just as ill prepared as we were for this one, that would be an absolute tragedy. Agreed. Um, and I, I appreciate the reflection. My mom is supposed to get her vaccine in the next 10 minutes, first dose. I feel like she should have gotten it sooner, but we've been as patient as we can. I mean, the rollout has been what it has been. And uh, hopefully, like you said, we've learned some lessons along the way. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts around the vaccine rollout. Well, you know, one of the things about the vaccine rollout that concerns me is that we've been so focused on the number of people getting vaccinated. How many people per day? Is it 1 million, 2 million, 3 million? We've lost sight of the fact that, that not everyone's at the same risk. Whose arms are the vaccines going into? You know, there's an advisory committee that provides recommendations to the CDC. And what they said is after you vaccinate healthcare workers and long-term care residents, essential workers should be vaccinated. People over 75 should be vaccinated. So you know, when you think about essential workers, that's, you know, that's police and fire. It's also the people working in the grocery store, the people driving the bus, the, the teachers and staff in our schools. And in many places, 
the, the focus on numbers has not led, led public health and local government to provide vaccines for those essential workers. And, you know, in community, in community across the country, we see the vaccine rates among white Americans much, much higher than the vaccine rates for Black and Latino Americans. And Black, Latino, and Native Americans have been hit the hardest during this pandemic. That really has to change. We hope it does. Dr. Richard Besser, thank you so much for your time. I, I, I could talk to you all day, but I want to honor the, the time they gave me to, to chat this morning. Thanks very much. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you.